Oh, good. Thank you. Uh, fractals? Yeah, fractals. So uh, we tamed the mathematical monster, fractals in science and art. Cool. Because they tried to throw them out, you know, in the late 1800s. We don't understand them, so they don't exist. Or at least <laughs> we don't understand them, so they're not nice spaces. And real mathematicians only study nice spaces. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, and uh, my, my other co-author, Jack Sanders Reed, is on board. Hi, Jack. And um, maybe uh, you, you could consider giving a talk in March. You're muted, Jack. <laughs> and um, so, yeah. I don't know what your clock says, but mine says we have two minutes. Jack, you're muted. You owe us a talk. <laughs> <laughs> That's automatic. Bingo, yeah. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll repeat it. Uh, you may be able to twist my arm, but probably not for March. It'll be a little bit longer than that before I'm, I'm ready to do anything. Yeah, we, we should be able to populate March, but it's, you know, it's nice to have new people on. Let's see who else is here. Got uh, Mary Robinson, Ed Freeman, Kings, Wells Cunningham's here, Scott Diamond. Oh, yeah. Got a good crew. Frank Rosnick. All right. Hi, Frank. And um, hey. Well, welcome to Science for the Board. Uh, Bill Sundermeyer was the president of FLIR Systems. We've been trying to get to, to, uh, to uh, science for the board. And today he's on because he's going to introduce our speaker for tonight. Bill? Thanks, Bruce. And can you hear me just fine? I guess I should say a little bit more about Bill. Bill, Bill, uh, is one of the smartest people I know. And he he exited FLIR uh, in time to enjoy life at a young age. So, but he was uh, incredibly uh, engaged when he was running FLIR and uh, we we did some fantastic things together. So, and he even tolerated John Miller. <laughs> <laughs> For all those years, John worked for him, and he never fired him. That tells you. Never. All right. So let me start uh, with John's bio. I'm going to give the formal one and a little bit of my own background for him. Uh, John Lester Miller has written five books, four with Dr. Ed Friedman, who kindly gives talks in this forum. John has written over 100 papers on electro optic systems. And John is the current chair and has previously chaired numerous times at our planet's largest conference on infrared technology. John has also chaired the classified military symposium. He has a BS in physics from USC and graduate work and degrees from Cal State Long Beach. University of Hawaii and an MBA of management from Regis College in Denver. John has over 41 years of experience in infrared technology, astronomy, intelligence, product development and phenomenology. He's currently running his own consulting company serving in the UN, governments, universities and industry. Other Notable accomplishments include, John is an avid traveler and adventurer. And I've had the honor of traveling with John twice in the African bush. John's ability to spread his DNA over the planet is surpassed only by his ability to feign being the weakest of the herd. John is the only person to have lost a moon rock on Orcas Island. John is a complete mythology denier He's the only CTO to be hired twice at FLIR Systems and never fired. John is a modern day Moses who wants to create milestones to exit the planet prior to the sun turning into a red giant. 
If you can see me, John, we've got to set some milestones. Set some milestones, like right now. So who is he who is so wise in the ways of science? John Lester Miller, also known worldwide, worldwide as Dr. Strange Photon. There you go, John. Thank you, Bill. Well, tonight, this is not two talks. It's really kind of one on the biography of William Herschel, our hero, and um, some history of infrared. Uh, Bruce suggested I combined the two, and I think it's a good, that's a good suggestion. As you will see, these are actually very much intertwined. Uh, Herschel discovered infrared. And I put the picture of me up because I uh, just want to make a note that my eyeglasses, you cannot see through in the infrared. Uh, gla normal glass does not transmit infrared. And that will come up a few times in this briefing. So I got a few charts from uh, in the beginning on what is infrared uh, that for many of you um, that it's too trivial, but for others you may not really know. Then I get into the biography of a Herschel and, and we'll talk about his sister as well at the end. And then uh, uh, some history of infrared, which I'll go through kind of quickly. And in conclusion, I got two funny, uh, ex -FLIR, two funny videos from FLIR. So to uh, launch the talk, this is the uh, uh, Spitzer Infrared Telescope Facility launched in Cape Canaveral. And you can see the 2000 Kelvin plume and it pierces this cloud and the cloud is totally absorbent. It, it does not transmit any of the infrared from this 200 and this 2000 degree plume. Uh, my credentials, uh, pretty much Bill went, went over all that. Infrared is um, a color of light. It's longer than what your eye can see. Uh, or I see from about oh, 0.4 to 0.7 microns. Infrared starts at normally about one micron out to about 20 microns. And most of the videos and the, the, the things I'll show are either in three to five microns, which is about 10 times the wavelength your eye can see, or eight to 12 microns, which is about 20 times your eye can see. So it's really, it's not heat rays, but it is related to heat. And Herschel's the one that figured that out. And I'll talk about that, but it's really a different color of light. All objects, uh, except for dark matter, uh, uh, radiate via the, what's called the Planck function. And I'll talk a little bit about that in the history. Even ice cubes, cold things still radiate in the infrared. They just radiate less energy the hotter it is, the more energy you radiate, and the peak of the radiation gets the smaller and smaller wavelengths. So the surface of the sun is around um, 5,000 degrees, and it radiates in, in yellow, as we can see. Your body is around uh, 300 degrees Kelvin, and it radiates around 10 or 11 microns, uh, much, much further out in, in the infrared. Come on, John, spell Planck's name right, for God's sake. Uh, hey, you know, <laughs> I can't spell. <laughs> so one thing is um, a little sidebar is um, infrared observations of Venus back in the 60s by Carl Sagan, none of the Carl Sagan, I'm going to butcher this other guy's name, I apologize, Velvika or something. They did some infrared observations of Venus. And you expect Venus to be hotter than the Earth. It's half the distance uh, to the sun, so it should have about four times the solar loading on it. But it was much, much hotter. The surface was way hotter than it should be. And actually, it was infrared observations of Venus that came up with uh, what's now called the greenhouse uh, gas effect or, or the greenhouse effect and the, that our current climate is being warmed up by. What happens is, the sun, just like a greenhouse, uh, emits in the visible, um, in the yellow and in the, in the visible, while our eyes evolve for the visible. It comes through the glass or in the greenhouse, heats up the plants, the plants radiate in the infrared. But again, looking at a picture of me, you can't see through my glasses. Normal glass absorbs infrared, so it heats up. 
And that's exactly what was hap what, what happened to Venus and is what's happening uh, to, to our planet, including with uh, water. As you saw that cloud get absorbed, the entire rocket plume uh, emission in, in the first video. Also, SF6, CO2, and methane, they all allow sunlight to come through, but they absorb in the infrared. Our knowledge of infrared is uh, we'll come up on the anniversary here in, a, in about a week, is 221 years old. Oh, our, our hero, William Herschel, on February 11th, 1800, discovered infrared. And now let's talk a little bit about, about, about William Herschel. Uh, he was actually German. He was born in uh, Hanover, Germany, emigrated to England at age 19, uh, died in 1882. Uh, he was one of these uh, obnoxious overachievers. Uh, not only was he uh, an astrophysicist and an astronomer, and we'll get into some of his discoveries, he was an accomplished musician and, and composer. He played the oboe, violin, harpsichord, and organ, and he composed 24 symphonies. This is his house in Bath. This is a uh, a picture I took, uh, one of my favorite places. And um, so he, he ended up spending a lot of his life in Bath, England. And over here, this is actually Lord Nelson's house. He lived next door to Admiral Nelson. <laughs> this is uh, where he, he made his own telescopes. And this was the furnace he would cook the, uh, uh, the copper and tin alloy in. And uh, him and his sister would grind up to 16 hours a day and grind these mirrors. He made over 400 mirrors from six inches up to 48 inches. And he, he would sell these. He would actually make some extra money uh, selling these. And they were pretty pricey. The King of Spain apparently paid 3,150 pounds for one of his telescopes. And this is back in the 1800s, in the early 1800s. That, that, was, that was a big chunk of change back then. One of the things that happened is this oven actually kind of blew up one time and it uh, spilled liquid metal onto the floor and, and him and his sister Carolyn and uh, uh, scarred them. And this is the actual floor. And these, top, these stones were like cracked because of the heat from the liquid metal being on it. And that's my foot. So in Bath, England, in his backyard, which is pictured here, he discovered Uranus uh, in March of 1781. He thought it was a very odd object. It looked like a disc. And uh, some Russian mathematicians uh, later confirmed within a year it was orbiting. He wanted to name it Planet George. Uh, he, he was the first person that we know of that, to, to, to discover a planet. All the other planets, Mercury through uh, uh, Saturn were known in antiquity. The, 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 the Greeks and, and the Romans knew them, so we don't know who discovered them. But he actually discovered uh, uh, Uranus, which led him to a lot of fame and fortune. Uranus, incidentally, happens to be about 90 degrees off kilter, which is unexplained. He became the king's astronomer and a friend of King George. King George had to move to Slough, which is outside London, uh, to be nearer to the king. And the king bought him a fancy crystal chandelier with numerous uh, few uh, silken prisons. And uh, Neil sent me this poem about Slough. Even today, Slough's not uh, a very nice place. And uh, they actually uh, wished the Germans would bomb Slough <laughs> back, in, back in the day. So the king bought him this chandelier with few silica prisms. A few silica is a little different than normal glass. It'll actually transmit to about four microns. This is one of the prisms. This was again from the, uh, the museum in, uh, in Bath, his house. There's uh, two there. There's at least one in London. There's a couple held in private collections. No one knows which one he really used, but Old William gets his fancy chandelier, gets on a ladder, and starts taking it apart so he can get the, the, these, these few silica prisms. And what he did was he replicated 
what Newton did. He took sunlight and uh, shined it through the prism. But his ingenious was, what he did was, he was the first to unify two pieces of physics, which is uh, photonics and light and thermodynamics. He took phenomenas and was measuring the temperature of the light. And the story goes, he brushed the phenomena aside to make notes. And then when he picked up the phenomena, he noticed that it was actually uh, hotter. And it was off to the, where there was no light. That was the shortwave infrared. And he called it calorific rays and published 34 papers on it. The, the term infrared did not get into use until the late 1800s. So he, he called it dark heat and calorific rays. And the genius was he was trying to be the first to try to unify two pieces uh, of, of, of physics. He did more than that. He also refracted these rays uh, from a fireplace and could prove that they were actually light and they, they acted just like light. So as a little uh, side note, when I was at his museum, I, I asked the curator, you know, where, where's this place in Slough where he did this? Because he didn't do this. He discovered Uranus in, in, in Bath, but infrared was discovered in Slough. And the... Uh, the curate says, oh, you don't want to go there. You don't want to go there. It's a bad neighborhood. I said, okay, well, go during the day. I just want to see, can, do you have an address or some of where this used to be? And the, the curate says, no, no, everything's been torn down. Everything was torn down before World War I. There's nothing left there. And there's nothing you can see there. Well, what's there today is a McDonald's. You can clog your arteries at the place mankind discovered infrared. The other thing he did in Slough was he built a huge telescope that King funded. It had a 1.2 meter mirror, which is actually a pretty good mirror. Um, and here's some drawings of it. It was 40 feet long. It didn't really do a whole lot. And uh, the general uh, conclusion is it's because it, it, it was made out of wood and wood set up. Uh, was a median structure that kept the secondary and the primary in alignment, and basically it was never in alignment. It was never properly aligned. So he, he didn't do much with that. But he did a lot of other astronomical discoveries. 800 binary stars, variable stars, him and his sister cataloged nebulas. He discovered at least a few, discovered four moons, two of Saturn and two, uh, two of uh, uh, Uranus. And he hinted and in his notes says Uranus might have rings, which was not confirmed until the pioneer probes went there. Uh, don't know how he did that. He concluded that the Milky Way, which in those days they thought that was the entire universe, he said it's not spherical. It's actually like the shape of a disk. He was able to do those measurements. And it has nothing to do with astronomy, but he had a microscope and he proved that coral is an animal, not a plant. Now, he worked a lot with his sister, which he called his excellent sister. She was all four feet and three inches tall, uh, suffered from typhus that they, they said stopped her growth at age 10. She lived with him in Bath and Slough, discovered numerous comets, asteroids, and nebula. And after uh, moving back to Germany, she started cataloging in, in, uh, the nebulas. And actually that rolled into what's now called the new general catalog or NGC. When you see NGC 1144 uh, referring to galaxy, that actually has its roots in, in his sister, Carolyn. She was the first one to be paid as an astronomer, at least known, and the first to have an official paid position um, um, in England. She was awarded the gold medal from the Royal Astronomy Society no other woman won it until Vera Rubin won it in 1996. It took that long before somebody else could compete with her. Uh, William ended up uh, marrying a rich widow in 1788, and this did not sit well with Carolyn. Uh, she was described as a bitter, jealous woman who worshipped her brother. Uh, she moved out after a violent uh, fight and eventually moved back to Germany. Uh, she died at age 97, 
and was buried uh, with a lock of William's hair, which is kind of weird. And that's actually a lock of his hair that's in the museum. Apparently there were several locks of his hair cut off him. Uh, I don't think it's pubic hair. I think it's just a red. All right, so history of infrared. So William Herschel discovers it on February 11th, 1800. Uh, he didn't put down the time, but graduate students have looked at it and they've kind of figured out in Slough in February, it was probably early afternoon, sometime between like noon and, uh, and two. And things started to progress. Uh, Rayleigh and Wine were working on trying to describe how things radiate. And they had this problem called a UV catastrophe or IR catastrophe. And it's very analogous to today with relativity and quantum mechanics where they, they just don't work together. Uh, they work in there, relativity works in its sphere of influence and uh, quantum works in its sphere, they're very small. This is how this was. The UV, they had, they had equations that could predict UV radiation and ones that could predict IR, but they didn't have one equation that could predict both. And they knew something was wrong. And along 1900 comes along Max Planck. And Max Planck, to read the quote at the bottom, says the whole, well, first of all, he was told, uh, become, a, become a doctor and MD. Everything in physics was done. Everything's understood except this, uh, uh, this radiometry detail. But Planck went and became a physicist and quoted, the whole procedure was an act of despair because a theoretical interpretation had to be found at any price. And what he did was he quantized the radiation and basically invented the photon, which is later called a photon. And he solved it with one simple equation, which you can see here. And it's actually on my back gate of my bend house. <laughs> uh, he, had a, he had a tragic life. He, uh, I believe he was married twice and both wives died on him. He had a son die on him. And he had another son that was in the SS in World War II. They couldn't stand Hitler and was part of that Valkyrie uh, <coughs> assassination attempt. Uh, and Hitler had his son executed. Then our other hero, Albert Einstein, he worked in the infrared. His postdoctorate thesis was actually on black body radiation. <coughs> he worked long and hard on black body radiation and Brownian motion, which is also related. And for those of you who don't know, he did not win his most famous um, um, theories were relativity. <coughs> Excuse me, he did not win the Nobel for relativity. He won it for the photoelectric effect. That's the exact effect that Bill, Bruce, and I, and Scott, and John Wilsey made money on at infrared. It's the same effect that's in your cell phone camera and in almost every camera. It's how photons, when reacting with certain materials will throw off electrons and then can be uh, made into digital imaging. And that's actually what he got the Nobel for. I'm gonna go quickly through some of these charts, not to bore you. In the 30s and 40s, lead salt detectors were made. A Japanese fellow predicted the pyroelectrics. Um, during World War II, there, were, there wasn't much infrared. Most of the effort was displaced by radar in both the UK and, and the US because it was the easier technology. However, during the end of the war, there was an infrared sniper scope that uh, was deployed in, um, in Asia and fighting Japan. Uh, and it was, um, it was a true infrared based on lead salts. The Germans, uh, this is a picture of the Germans, also deployed infrared in their tanks in World War II. And it wasn't really an imager, it was more of a hotspot detector. And then when they saw something that was hot, they just shot it, basically. Two old pictures. Uh, one is, uh, both of these are from the 1940s. Surprisingly, Life Magazine had some scanned infrared picture of a woman in a negligee, who was obviously, used to be a man, uh, laying in bed next to her. As far as I know, this picture over on the left is the first infrared image. And if anybody knows of anything earlier, please send it to me. This appeared in 1943 in Popular Science. And what it is, it's the man with his arms up. So this is his like left arm, his right arm, and uh, th this is the man. 
pretty crude compared to what, what we were doing. Uh, in the 50s, INSBE comes along. Um, the nomenclature and radiometric units start to get uh, developed. There, there's an image of a man. Um, here's an old um, Swedish Agema sensor uh, that, that was made. In the 60s, it um, continued on and uh, really became the war in Vietnam. Uh, Texas Instruments deploys the first FLIR and coined the term FLIR. And FLIR means forward looking infrared. And apparently, what they had before then that, believe it or not, Singer, the, the, the manufacturer of the sewing machines, was in the infrared. Singer and TI, they would make these down looking infrareds that were kind of scanned back and forward and used a motion of the plane to give you the other dimension and eventually make, make, make an image. The problem, it turned out, um, in the in early 60s in Vietnam is you have to fly right over your enemy. You have to fly right over the people trying to shoot you down in order. And there was some general that said, damn it, I don't want a down-looking infrared. I want a forward-looking infrared. Uh, so the term was coined, and that's the first flare made by uh, Texas Instruments, which is now uh, DRS. And it was deployed on a C-130 gunship. And then later um, on the F-4, Raytheon made a flare uh, called a tram flare. And one of the things, they went into somewhere, Haiphong or somewhere, or, or Hanoi, and they bombed the heck out of the, uh, uh, the a refinery. And the pilots were only shooting tanks that were full. Here, here's a whole flare, flare image. This is a water tank in Lake Oswego, but you can see the water. <laughs> which is colder, and then uh, in the sun, it heated up the air and the tank above it. So you can see it's clearly, you know, 90% full of water. <coughs> um, so the, these F4s went in and they destroyed all the, uh, all the tanks that had uh, fuel, that had oil in it. The next day, the North Vietnamese get out all, all, all the uh, workers and says, we have spies among us that told the Americans which tanks were full. And of course that wasn't true. And the sad story is that they got out pistols and executed about seven or eight people, but uh, uh, wanting a spy to say he was a spy, but they wasn't, there was no spy. Um, the more funny part of this story was we had applications engineer Lisa West working at Flair. And she came to me one day and said, hey, can we tell, uh, the oil, say, oh, how much oil is in the tank? And I, yeah, I showed her this picture and told her that story. And they would do what she and her, and her cohorts were doing. They was, this was when oil was more expensive than today. Uh, they were selling, they ended up selling a bunch of infrared cameras to oil refineries in the LA and Southern California area. And my first question to her was, oh, why do they want it? Don't they know how much oil is in theirs? Yeah, they know how much oil is in theirs. But they wanted to know, what Texaco wanted to know was how much oil was in the Chevron cakes, how much oil was in the Urco cakes. And they all were running around with our cameras looking at each other's uh, tanks to see how much oil was in there. Um, in the 1970s, astron infrared astronomy really, really, two things happened. Infrared astronomy really started taking off with uh, the Kuiper um, uh, airplane astronomy down here, that door, uh, a telescope looked through. Three companies were formed, one of several of us, FLIR Systems in 1978, Inframetrics, and uh, GEMO was actually formed probably a little earlier in the 60s. Um, that, all, that all became part of FLIR, now to be all part of uh, Teledyne. One of the things I'm most proud of in the infrared is really weather satellites. And uh, literally, this is an old spec that said hundreds of millions of lives have been saved. It's probably many hundreds of millions by now. It wasn't until the 60s and 70s, we actually had infrared weather satellites where we could track storms. <laughs> we could track uh, that bad thunderclouds, but more importantly, hurricane, hurricanes and typhoons, and give people notice days in advance a hurricane's coming in. And 
you need infrared for this for two reasons. One is uh, it works at night, whereas visible doesn't work at night. So you, so if you had just had visible satellites, you would lose all, all the weather information at night. Uh, but during the day, uh, during night and day, you can use infrared. And the latest goes next. Actually, has a little gimbal on it with infrared, and they can actually, if if, if in hurricane, I'm sorry, in tornado alley, if there's tornadoes about to go in Kansas, they can stare at it and get an update about every second on what's going on to provide uh, provide warning for people. Uh, the 80s, uh, the applications abounded, uh, that became commercialized. Uh, there were over 100,000 common modules made, which, which are Mercat teleofocal planes. Uh, infrared astronomy started booming. And uh, the military really was still in the driver's seat. And probably isn't now, but was then. So here's, here's a, this is an old common module video uh, of, um, of some Huey helicopters. And there, uh, there's a guy on the ground there. There's a friendly, he's obviously in communication with the, uh, uh, with the helicopter. And you can see what he's doing. <laughs> he flips off the helicopter. And then they must say, hey, you know, check your fly, man. Check your fly. Excuse me. And here's another uh, military. This is a F-18 landing on a carrier. And this very thin line kind of, that, that's the carrier deck. So let me play this because it's kind of interesting. We'll play it once and then twice. So this is an F-18 and when it landed properly, it rolled right over the infrared sensor. So um, lo look at its wheels. Its tires are all cold. It's been up, you know, at high altitude. It's been cold. They're deployed. Watch when it hits the deck. The tires instantly turn white hot. They become so hot from the uh, weight of the aircraft. Another application uh, that started in the 80s and 90s was a veterinary. Uh, and especially large animal veterinary, most zoos have infrared cameras and they must have loved this shot because they get to look into the hippo's mouth and make sure his teeth are okay and he doesn't have any abscesses and everything looks right. That's exactly what they, they wanted the hippo to do. So a little bit about infrared astronomy. It started really in the 60s, but got going in the 70s and it's almost dominant now. In the old days, cold asteroids, comets, detecting earth crossing asteroids, volcanoes on Io. I used to calibrate when I was at Mauna Kea, infrared sensors using the volcanoes on Io. Stellar formation, chemical ID. I mean, it's, the astronomy is rich. And here's how, that's, that's where I worked on, whoops, on Mauna Kea, an infrared telescope facility. This is the SOFIA which is a, a rather large telescope in a 747 and that flies above in the stratosphere. And interestingly enough, for those of us that live in Oregon, for many years, this was operated by Evergreen Aviation out of McMinnville. They lost that contract, they screwed it up. But uh, the NASA guys would be uh, the scientists, but they Evergreen would supply the pilots, buy the fuel, do the aircraft maintenance, all, all the air, aircraft stuff. And my, my boss here, uh, Eric Becklin, ended up uh, running that place. So there's many astronomical killer apps uh, for infrared, and including most of the instruments on the Hubble. Not all, but most were uh, infrared instruments in the short wave, mid wave. And most were made by, almost all of the instruments were made, the focal planes were made by Teledyne. Ball made a lot of instruments. Martin Marietta made some, but uh, the, guy, the people that are buying FLIR made almost all the focal planes. And there was even a telescope named after Herschel. The largest space telescope to date, three and a half meters, 
It was in the long wave infrared and millimeter. I've discovered a lot of new exoplanets, black holes, water around stars, and galaxy formation. It's going to be followed up by the James Webb, uh, which hopefully is successful. It will be a 6.5 meter cryogenic telescope uh, at Lagrange point, about a million kilometers or a million miles from the moon. Um, there, uh, most of its instruments are infrared, again, made by Teledyne. And they're looking back to X-ray events in the infrared. They are redshifted so much in the early universe that, that these X-ray features are now uh, in spectra, are now in the infrared. And this is a NASA uh, animation. I believe this is M81. That the visible is then the visible, and that little circle is, is the infrared. And what this shows is the dust and gas penetrating ability of the infrared. And you can see much clearer the galaxy. And you can note there's actually a lot fewer stars than you might have thought when you were first looking at it. And another place I work, Wilson and Palmar, they, uh, back in the 50s and 40s, they started to think that some of these galaxies don't quite have enough stellar mass to, to rotate and to be uh, uh, a, single, a single gravitationally bound object. And it really wasn't until we got these infrared images in the, in the 70s, 80s, and 90s that we realized there's not enough mass in these galaxies. And so the whole theory of dark matter uh, uh, came about. This is a nebula, and this has gone through various uh, longer and longer wavelengths in the infrared. And you can see how things are different, how there's more information as you go into that. And all these squares are stars like our sun that could have planets around them. Uh, the 90s in infrared saw a lot of uh, proliferation in the military, uh, commercial, uh, smaller uh, 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 cameras, and even bigger cameras, <laughs> like, like this gimbal here in, in the aughts. A proliferation of uncooled. Uncooled became declassified in the in the late 90s and aughts. And um, the, this is actually an automobile sensor made by FLIR. This is the, the picture of the focal plane, the pixel. And uh, you know, FLIR is on BMWs, Rolls Royces, and uh, is in a good spot uh, with ADAS and self-driving cars. Also, uh, UAVs. This one's for uh, Border Patrol, but it's a predator. And this type of UAV committed the first remote killing of a person uh, back, at, back in uh, late 2001. It's made by General Dynamics. Here's the infrared sensor. Uh, this is made by Raytheon on this particular one. Uh, all, uh, almost all the sensors on these platforms are made by Raytheon. Westcam has a few, I think in Saudi and Italy, but uh, pretty much all. Uh, all, all Raytheon systems on these UAVs. And after the uh, Columbia accident where ice uh, broke into the wing of the Columbia, uh, NASA deployed infrared cameras to watch every, every launch. And these were highly scrutinized. And what they were trying to do with them was, you can see how cold uh, the central tank is. I see ice falling off. You can see ice will appear very black if it falls off and, and hits the shuttle. All right. Well, running a little short time here. We get some questions. I got two uh, FLIR, funny FLIR videos to show uh, in conclusion. So the first one is, uh, you know, I love infrared farts. Uh, this was actually uh, shown on Saturday Night Live. Next Monday, the stock jumped like 15, 20%. And we're all like, what? We had no announcement. What did we do? What did we do right? It was just a flare. It, it had our symbol on it, and it was just a fart video on Saturday Night Live could shove the stock price up. Maybe.
Well, what can I say? We had some fun at Fleur. It was a, it was a great ride. So that, that's all I have. Uh, entertain questions if you want. I just say that was phenomenal. I mean, just just absolutely phenomenal. Uh, Thank you. And uh, a, a small small world thing is is uh, I knew someone who who used some of the multispectral images you described. I thought he was the brightest scientist in this this group I was in, and they used those to uh, estimate the Russian wheat harvest far better than Russia knew it. And so your story about, well, Exxon knows how much oil is in their tanks. They need to know Chevron. That was really great. So thank you. That was just wonderful. Oh, thank you. I'll ask John. Um, yeah, so I agree. It was really fun. The only, only problem with your talk is it's too short. Um, I love the yeah. story. Um, what do you think the future? What are we going to see next in infrared? Any ideas? Oh yeah, um, even FLIR has moved to strange super lattice detectors. Uh, they're going to be. They promise to be even cheaper, much more sensitive than uncooled, uh, and we're going to see the complete proliferation uh, on vehicles, on in our houses. Uh, it's becoming a commodity, and. You know, I was fortunate enough that, you know, when I started in infrared in 1980, it, uh, it, it was a high tech exotic uh, technology. And I, I'm afraid it's gonna become just a uh, race to the bottom, uh, the cheapest uh, and total commodity. There's a lot in astronomy. There's still a lot of amazing stuff to be done in astronomy. And Teledyne really owns that, uh, uh, both the ground base and space base uh, uh, infrared instruments. The other use that I'm more familiar with is medical. Um, in fact, people can have it in their home to use for pain relief. And I wondered how you felt about using it uh, in the home or just using it in medical situations. And also I've read that that's a problem with cell phones and I don't know if that's true or not, but I thought it is. Yeah, I can't come on cell phones. I can't on the medical. Yeah, you know, I, I chased that many times. I had SBIR at FLIR to do some uh, uh, breast tumor detection. Um, it, it, it works out well. It works out good in medical for burns, uh, for skin burns, for doctors. Uh, it's also been used in like MASH hospitals uh, when they open somebody up or they're, they're doing emergency surgery to make sure uh, the internal bleeding has stopped. The, the real problem is it's a, it's a surface effect. So it really can't uh, go in very far. And so, you know, if you're, you're, you're right, if your elbow, hurts and you've got a joint problem it's going to get or a tumor there it's going to get more blood and more heat but you go to the doctor and say my elbow hurts so it's got much more traction in the veterinarian sciences where the animals can't tell the vet hey my 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 my, my, my hip hurts my, my elbow hurts um for for humans it's 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 very limited unfortunately Ed, you were going to say something? I just had a, let me, when I saw that video, is that people's breath? Could you use it to detect natural air flows in a room and, and say something about COVID transmission? Oh, uh, you know, you could if the temperatures are, are, are very different. So yeah, if, you, if, you're, if you're in New England and it's cold and you have your heater on, you could see yeah, your vent, and you can see the, the air coming out of the vent. Uh, how that would relate to COVID, I, I, I don't really know. I mean, I'll get a five degree C difference maybe between exhaled air and room temperature. The exhaled air is probably 35 C when you breathe it out, but it cools off quickly. I don't know. I mean, it. Yeah, well, 
even cheap infrared cameras will do about 50 mil kelvins or a 20th of a degree. And the real high-end scientific ones, they can do uh, 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 un under a uh, thousandth of a degree. Yeah, but I mean, typically you can't really see air with infrared unless there's a lot of CO2 in it. Well, yeah, yeah, it, it's pretty transparent uh, yeah. unless there's CO2, but you can still, if you point infrared sensor at your uh, air conditioning or, or heat event, you, you can see a plume uh, several feet. And John, uh, John, mm -hmm. how about, how about the, the idea of blending? Uh, maybe mention that for the audience a little bit. Blending different wave bands, the different ways that's done. Yeah, that's been sort of a holy grail for decades, uh, uh, where you would fuse a visible uh, with an infrared. And Fleur designed some of its products out of Sweden to uh, give you. Um, <clears throat> A, a pseudo increased resolution of the visible and, and, and then the infrared. Uh, yeah, uh, this is, this has been a lot, billions have been spent on this and very little has really come of it. But yeah, you, you can do that. You can, you can fuse the visible with the infrared. And, and night vision for, for driving too. Yeah, that's, uh, again, all, our, our alma mater, FLIR, are the only infrared sensors that have really cracked the automobile industry. You know, on being Beamers and Rolls Royces, and I think they're going on something else now, but yeah. Oh, many, the, pro many. the problem I have with infrared, I hate to say this because I'm an infrared guy, but the problem I have with self-driving vehicles is as soon as you get rain or you get bird shit on, on, on the window, or you get mud splashed up or snow packed in, you're not gonna see anything. You're gonna lose your, the car's gonna lose its vision, which means it, it won't be able to drive. Whereas radar, hate to say it, but radar can, uh, can see through all that stuff. And sonar. Any reason we can't see you? Uh, yeah, I, I'm kind of data limited where I am. Uh, so I, I, if I, I guess it is a video. In a bar in Key West. You can turn off your, your PowerPoint now and then we, then we could actually see what you look like. Yeah. Okay. Well, I, 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 uh, I, uh, I, I'm a new guy. Uh, I have not. Turn it off. Turn it off. Turn it off. That's Cholave. He's saying he doesn't want to see you. <laughs> doesn't want to see the other end of him. Looks John like Uranus. <laughs> John, how about commenting about uh, the overmarketing of the use of infrared and things like uh, saunas and uh, medical devices that use infrared to help you heal, or it's just really heat? What are your yeah. thoughts on that? Uh, pretty much all bullshit. Yeah. Uh, it, it's a surface effect that, you know. Uh, it's no different than putting a heating pad. You know, if a, if a if an electrical heating pad helps you, that's fine. <laughs> it's just the same as uh, uh, some infrared light or, or anything like that. Yeah, there's really there's a lot of charlatans in the field. And uh, in fact, this is uh, to, to Judy's earlier question. This is part of the reason why infrared isn't used in the medical which it could be for some things, again, like skin burns, uh, like certain tumors that are really near the surface or skin cancer, is because in the 70s and 80s, there were a bunch of charlatans and chiropractors that would get infrared and they would claim they, they healed and stuff. And the uh, Department of uh, uh, Health and Human Services put out a study back in the, the 80s at some point saying that, you know, really criticizing the infrared. And they kind of threw the baby out with the bathwater. I mean, they were right that all these charlatans were, were totally incorrect, but <laughs> that they stopped funding and stopped a lot of the research on how infrared could be used uh, medically in, in, in a real um, scientific way. 
Uh, it's used in pharmaceuticals. Uh, Andy Teach's brother has a company that uh, basically caters to big pharma, and um, they look at petri dishes because you, know, you could have like COVID in a petri dish, and you can watch you can watch it metabolize, and you can watch it form, and then you drop in maybe uh, uh, your vaccine or so, and and see if it dies or not. And, and so you can use infrared. It's used a lot in uh, in pharmaceuticals. Hey, John. Yeah. So let's say I want to mount a nighttime raid on Area 51 and <laughs> uh, camouflage myself against infrared. How would I go about doing that? With an umbrella. At least see. No, uh, you're out of line. No, <laughs> I, I probably can't talk. I probably can't. We can't answer that, Peter. Uh, <laughs> Okay. I so, just well, did. Oh, bullshit. <laughs> I'm not going there. Did they tell you they have to kill you? Now, there, there's something called ghillie suits, which you can look at, and they're these goofy-looking camouflage suits. And they do work for a short term in the infrared, but basically you're overheating in one of those things, and the heat's got to come out. So uh, eventually, a uh, ghillie suit will work, will, will will camouflage you for maybe a minute, five minutes, but after that, it, uh, it, the infrared even sees through it. There are some, the Israelis have claimed they got a, uh, a cloaking device for tanks and vehicles. And... Big umbrella. John, you know, what's the status of night glow? Are there sensors out there that are able to get noise floor low enough yet to use the ionosphere? Yeah, you know, everybody keeps claiming that in gas, and you and I never been able to see it. Uh, um, Paladine does have some shortwave astronomical infrared that is, that, that's cryo-cooled, that's almost a photon counter, and that can do that really well. It's very expensive, though. Uh, and they just, as far as I know, they just sell it into uh, uh, scientific markets. As a start, John, what do you think the next easily commercialized, readily available infrared product will be? Oh boy, if I knew the answer to that, I'd start a company and make make a fortune. <laughs> well, you say it's easily commoditized. What do you see like the direction of that? Yeah, I I think it puts up high barriers. You know, I said it's spy and sure. Uh, 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 a conference there and it's like these little one and two and three man companies are getting up and saying they're going to sell to Toyota and there was like, no you're not Toyota's not going they might Toyota might buy you and buy your IP but they're not going to be buying from a two or three man company you know they don't even like buying from Flair you know uh, so there's a lot of barriers there uh, you know you got Flair and DRS and um, the military, you got Lockheed Martin and Raytheon and Seek IR. These companies uh, will, are the ones that are pushing it uh, to, the to the lowest limit. They're pushing it down uh, to the least common denominator and, and trying to make it cheap. And I don't know what the next one will be. I mean, Flair did not do well with their uh, iPhone attachment. That was supposed to be... Uh, uh, a big killer app, and you know they never sold. Well, it never worked out very well. It was very cheap, <laughs> low margins. Whereas the people in this conference, we we worked on expensive, high margin things. Okay, well, what do you think? Um, I see Blaze Dagelitis is on here. You you, you oh, have a question now, don't you, Blaze? Hey, Blaze. Oh, you're, you're, we can't hear you, Blaze, if you're talking. Sorry about that. Yeah, we use a lot of FLIRs. Yeah, what is it you guys do? Uh, mostly airborne uh, intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance aircraft. 
integration. So <clears throat> radars, FLIRs, electronic warfare. So uh, I actually, we just uh, are about to get a contract with the Portland Police Bureau to uh, replace their downlink system to provide video downlink of the FLIR they have on their Cessna 182 aircraft. So uh, Portland has a police bureau. <laughs> they're not defunded yet. Well, I hope they're not. <laughs> so, well, well, Can you say something about the status of FLIR for uh, detecting methane leaks. Yeah, it's uh, well, I, I can't talk to FLIR systems, I've been gone for almost six years. Uh, but they had gas uh, detections. That has been another holy grail. Um, a lot of companies I consult with are trying to do that. Uh, it can do it, it can do it very well. Met methane is a very strong um, absorber in the infrared, <clears throat> so it does uh, extremely well in detecting methane leaks uh, at factories, refineries, or even in the ground. Um, but that doesn't, and the margins are high, and uh, you know, a, a refiner will play a lot, pay a lot for a camera if it if it prevents an explosion and killing people. So, uh, but that doesn't really seem to have taken off, and I'm not really sure why. <coughs> Scott, if you're talking, we can't hear you. Sorry, hit the button twice. So it hasn't taken off because um, because you think there's a market outside of refineries? I mean, I always thought it, we made a lot of money, but there was just a small market. Is there a big need for finding methane elsewhere? I'm unaware. Yeah, there are <coughs> 2 million miles of pipelines in the United States alone. And these pipelines can leak. Uh, a friend of mine had, uh, had an aunt killed in L.A. where uh, the street blew up. Uh, uh, in my bend house, about two blocks away from my bend house, there was a leak and, and the house blew up and burned the guy to death. Oh. Uh, so, yeah, there's two million miles of uh, pipes in just this country alone. Uh, also for environmental monitoring. Uh, one of the big, big concerns with global warming would be if the Siberian permafrost starts melting, because it's holding in methane, and the methane will bubble up. Uh, so just monitoring that, uh, which is probably best done from space, but nevertheless, um, monitoring these pipes and the refineries. And it's a, I can't remember, it's a fair, is it a cool detector you need to, to spot methane, or is it, uh, I mean, how, how expensive of a thing uh, does it have to be? It's, okay. FLIR makes a cold when everybody except for one company makes a cold detector. There's a company out of Texas, out of Houston, in the, in the uh, refinery business called Rebellion Photonics, and they use Uncool. And they claim they can do, you know, to a certain extent, uh, they, they can do the job. And they, they, their, their, their marketing thing is we're cheaper, we've got to be closer to it. And yeah, maybe we don't do, you know, a really tiny little leak that a cold detector can do. Uh, but Rebellion uh, could, could could own that market if they really can do this with Uncool. Should I um, introduce next week's speaker? Or we have any more questions? Yeah, more? please. Okay. So next week, we're going to have Dan Rosignol. And I don't know if he's on the call, actually. Dan, are you? So, so but anyway, he, he uh, has a career in drug development. I believe he has a PhD. I went to high school with him. <laughs> so he's, been, he's been listening on all, all, all these calls, and he's been really enjoying it, especially the vaccine uh, discussions. And so he, um, he volunteered to do a talk. It'll be a two-part talk. The first one will be next week. And uh, maybe he'll pull the curtain back on 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 why it takes uh, billions of dollars to uh, develop a drug. He worked in New Jersey for his entire career and recently retired. And so uh, 
you'll be hearing more about that. I'll send off some uh, some information. And uh, so, John, uh, th thanks a lot for doing this. Um, everybody, sure. let's, let's, give, let's give him a hand. And uh, thanks, John. We'll uh, see you thanks, next, John. next week. Oh, John. Thanks, John. Very interesting. Hi. Thank you so much. Hi. Thanks, John. Can you share the IR video of the, uh, or give yeah. me a link to it? I'd love to show that to my climate change class because it really, it really nails the, the greenhouse effect beautifully. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, wh wh which video? Where, 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 where the uh, plume disappears in the cloud. Oh yes, I can. That's a NASA video, so it's not copyrighted. Yes, I, 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 I can send that. Because it, it, it I mean, it just blew, blew me away. It's, it's so neat. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> a little cloud obscures an entire rocket. Yeah, that's yeah. the point of that. Yeah, that's a NASA video, so that's not copyrighted. Uh, absolutely. Okay. I think I got Harold. I think I have your email. I'll send it to you. It's, it's, it's small. Thanks, John. Yeah. I mean, it's just it blew me away. Yeah. Okay. Great talk. Thank you. <clears throat> Sorry, I'll not be around for the next five weeks. Well, good luck. Why? What are you doing, Peter? <laughs> My class is on um, that I'm giving is is uh, at this this time on Wednesday night. Oh, oh. sorry. Well, oh. Why did you pick that? That was a dumb time for you to pick. <laughs> John, uh, wouldn't the visual uh, video of that rocket taking off through the cloud wouldn't that look pretty much the same? Uh, I doubt it. I've seen rockets go through clouds and they light up the cloud. It, it, it scatters the light and disperses it. But I, I don't think it would be quite the same. Think of a moonlit night and a cloud goes by. You see a diffuse moon. Yeah. I mean, unless it's a, a real thick cloud, it obscures it. But yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it scatters it, but most of the light still gets through. Okay, I'm gonna I'm going to um, end the call. Five, four, three, two, one. Thanks, Thanks a lot. Bye. Night.